Okay, <clears throat> welcome everyone to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh. Um, still in virtual mode for now. Um, we will hopefully be getting back to physical meetings at some point quite soon, but um, we will always be broadcasting live on Zoom and YouTube, even if we are back in, in person. And my name is Mark Phillips. I'm the president of the society. So welcome to you all, especially our large international audience on YouTube that we, we, we usually seem to get. <laughs> So coming up tonight, um, I'll um, give us a rundown on what talks we have coming up over the next few months. And then we'll have a talk from Professor Don Polacco of the University of Warwick on the effect of stellar activity on detection of terrestrial planets. And he says there'll be uh, something for everyone in that, <laughs> from the experience to the, to the new as well. And after that, uh, we'll have uh, the sky in September from Alan Pickup. Just a, a few welcomes, and um, we, we've had quite a few new members recently. Um, Rebecca Higgett, Hadrian Hughes, Alan Murdy, Chris Roper, and Donald Thompson. If you could all unmute and welcome as normal. I hope you enjoy your membership. And we, we're now up to 145. We've had really good growth over the last, um, last couple of years. And if you're not a member and would like to join, it's not very expensive at all, £30 or £15 if you're a student or uh, unwaged or, or of the older, older category. Um, all our talks, um, we stream, uh, we put on our YouTube channel and you'll find information on our website and Facebook and Twitter as well. So um, keep following us and um, you'll, you'll be able to know what's coming up from us. And this is what's coming soon. So on the 8th of September, we'll have our monthly imaging and observing group meeting. That is for members only. Um, that's, that's a very active group that we have where we discuss the images that we're taking, techniques, and what we're observing in the night sky as well. On the 17th of September, we have something a little bit different. Um, Catherine Rena Evans um, is going to be talking about exploring astronomy and space through philately. So there are a lot of stamps that have been printed over the years to do with space and astronomy, and that should be really interesting. 25th of September, we have something really quite special. Um, Bruce Vickery, one of our members, has given us a few talks about the Venus tablets on Misaduka. And this is a, an archaeological and astronomical problem that's been um, troubling um, people for hundreds of years. Uh, Bruce has a solution. Is it the solution or a solution? Well, I think it, whatever, it's going to be quite a, a special event that, and it, it will be definitely worth watching. We'll have quite a few special guests on that one as well, but um, that's one not to be missed. On the 1st of October, um, Mike Shaw will be doing a talk on astro landscape photography. Now this, we hope, will be the first uh, meeting where we can be back in person at the Augusta United Church in Edinburgh. Um, but rest assured, we will still stream that online on YouTube and on Zoom for, for members. Mike will actually be in the USA, so um, he will be a laptop at the front of the, of, of, of the hall rather than a physical person. But hopefully we can get um, speakers who have legs as well as heads in the future. And um, 6th of October, <coughs> a monthly imaging and observing group again. <clears throat> On the 5th of November, um, Justin Campbell White is from Dundee University, so he does have legs and is prepared to cross um, the bridge into Edinburgh, and we will have a physical meeting there. He'll tell us about accretion and inner disk of pre-main sequence stars. Uh, Justin used to work on the Hoist project. In fact, he's still the co-lead on that, and that's uh, something we've had quite a few talks about, and a few of us actually um, contribute data to as well. 10th of November, Imaging Observing Group again. And on the 19th of November, we have Mr. Comet himself, David H. Levy, who will be talking to us from the USA uh, about his life, basically, and his astronomical journey. So that should be, should be really interesting as well. So keep an eye on what's, what's going on on our website. And I'm delighted to see you on YouTube uh, if you want to follow us. And with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Don Polanco from the University of Warwick. Um, I, I knew Don at university, but we hadn't seen each other for about 36 years since we left. And um, I've seen him twice in the last year, I think, which is quite amazing. Uh, but I, will... I think you'll find it's twice in the last month. Last month it was, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so it will be to you, Don. 
I'll put my screen up. Uh, I presume you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, this is a talk that um, I've been developing for a while. It's actually based on so based on real research, um, and some of it is research level. So, but some of it isn't. But the idea here is to give you a better idea of what it's like in the planet detection and characterization world, because we see lots of um, press releases all the time. And I think if you can walk away from this talk and understand the difficulties that are involved, possibly make it could make you a bit more critical of what's being presented in front of you. Um, because especially over the next few years, in fact, over the last few years and the next few years, there's gonna be some biggish discoveries made. There'll be claims about life and all this kind of stuff in the next few years, I'm sure. But um, I think it's important that we, we that, that you are able to assess how reliable the information is in front of you. Okay, so a couple of uh, warnings at the beginning. The first is that Every, everything we're trying to measure in exoplanets is small. Even for hot Jupiters, the effects are small. There are very few telescopes that were ever built to do this, and we've been retrofitting them to make them make these observations. We're getting to the point now where we have telescopes that are actually designed to do these, these observations, but they're still small, and I hope you'll, you'll appreciate soon quite how small they are. So, and that means that um, uh, anything to do with planets is, is always difficult, even for hot Jupiters, it's, it's still difficult, it's never trivial, and it's always potentially prone to errors. Part of the reason for that is that we measure relative to the, their host stars, and uh, these, I mean, getting ages of stars, for instance, is a very difficult thing to do. That getting sizes of stars is not so easy. Um, and as you go to smaller and lower mass planets, then things just get harder and harder and harder. So anyway, you'll get to get to see how these measurements are made and see what the kind of problems are. And then the other thing, of course, is that if the star varies, then the, me the measurements are even more difficult. Now, when I say vary here, I don't mean Betelgeuse variations or Myra variations. I mean variations like the sun or less. So small variations can have a big impact on any of the derived planetary um, uh, quantities, and especially it has big implications for measurement of planetary atmospheres. So the bottom line is though, to understand our, our planet, we need to understand our star. That's going to be vital in here as well. And the difficulty is, unless you understand what you're looking at, you don't see the problems and the difficulties. And that all comes down to, in the end, how much you can trust what's being presented to you. So the key word in this is motion. And this is going to come up time and time again. And we're talking about motions of stars in orbits, um, motions of planets. It's, uh, it's key to everything. Anyway, here's a quick outline. I'm going to go very quickly over discovery methods. I've got to say I'm sick to death talking about discovery, so I'll do it very quickly. And I'll especially concentrate on the ones that are important to this talk. I'm going to talk about spectroscopy, and I'm going to talk about absorption lines. I'm going to talk about um, Doppler measurements, the radial velocity measurements. Um, and the size of the signals you expect to see for different kinds of planets. Um, I'm going to have an aside and talk about something called the RM effect, the Ross to McLaughlin effect. Um, I'll probably only, I won't have much time to talk about that, but it's so interesting. I thought I'd put it in here. I'm then going to go back and talk about solar activity, because this is the only star we can look at in with sufficient detail to understand what's actually going on, we think. 
And then I'm going to look at the effect of activity on measurements of brightness and on measurements of radial velocity or Doppler measurements. Because those are the measurements we need to say something about or to characterize our planets. Then we're going to look quickly at causes of activity. And then we're going to have this magical number of 10 centimeters per second. How can we measure um, radial velocities at 10 centimeters per second? Because that is the motion that an Earth like planet induces in, the, in a sun like star at 1 AU. So that's the magic number that we need to work at. And I'm going to say something about the implications for the future. So firstly, just a few words about direct imaging. This has come of age uh, recently. Here's a couple of discoveries, or I think the Fommel Hawk B1, which is the first image over here, has turned out not to be a planet, but in fact a lump of dust orbiting Fommel Hawk, which is underneath this occulting bar in here. But this is real. This is, I think this is Eridanus B, I think. Um, uh, it's the planet, uh, uh, so you can see it actually moving here. So this is real, but these sort of imaging planets are not terrestrial. They're big gas giants, usually at quite a distance from their star. And the stars and the planets tend to be pretty young. So the planets are giving out um, significant uh, radiation of their own. So they're doing more than just reflect light. Um, so if we want to go to small planets, this isn't the route currently, maybe one day. Uh, radial velocity is how the first planets were discovered. And I've just got this little cartoon just so that you can see it. And so we have, uh, we're over here, we're looking this way. Here's a binary star now. And of course, they're orbiting the center of mass for the system. So the more massive object is in a very small orbit, while the less, least massive object is in a much bigger orbit. And so if we look at the spectrum and we look at absorption lines coming from these two objects, we see there's the rest wavelength for a, for a particular absorption line. And we see the lines moving backwards and forwards around that wa rest wavelength, depending on their Doppler shift. So if you look at this, this fainter B object here, the amplitude is much bigger because it's moving much faster because it's in a bigger orbit. Um, and, and you can see that when it's moving away from us here, it's red shifted. When it's moving towards us, it's blue shifted. And it moves in antiphase to the big star, which is here, because it's not moving in such a big orbit. Now, imagine if this was a planet, then the, the light, it's, well, it doesn't emit light, it's reflecting light. And so we wouldn't see it, or at least it would be a lot fainter than the star. But its gravity gives it away. So it still induces this reflex motion in its host star. So in here, the B lines would disappear and we would just see the lines from the host star moving backwards and forwards. And basically the size of this amplitude, size of the amplitude, the size of the orbit depends on how massive the planet is. If you look at our solar system and look for the center of mass of our solar system, it's actually within the surface of the sun. It's not the center of the sun. And it's, it's, it's so close to the center of the sun because the sun just dominates the mass in the system. Anyway, so you can actually plot the motion of the, the star. So this is a planet now. So this is the motion of the host star. The planet, if you could see it, would have a massive amplitude. So this is velocity. So that's the speed that these lines are moving at versus time. If you could plot the planet, it would be moving in antiphase. So this, this would be um, zero velocity here. And the planet would be down here at this point, And then over here somewhere at this point uh, of time. Um, and it's most of the original planets were discovered through this reflex motion in their host stars. But there is a downside to this. But I should just say that if you have multiple planets, then the observations needed need to be fit not by a single sinusoid like this for a circular orbit, but by a much more complicated um, multi-component model. So I think this is a four planets, three planet system. 
Um, and it's just, you need to get a lot of observations to tie it down. The downside of this is that you don't actually ever measure the mass of the planet. You can infer the mass of the planet, um, but you don't, because you don't know the inclination of the orbit of that planet to the star, you only ever get a lower limit for the mass of the planet. So it means that some of the original planets that were only found through radial velocities are probably not planets at all. Anyway, moving on. So this is um, the transit technique, which we, we, we do more of in this country. And it's really quite simple. That's why I like it, because it's, it's basically geometry here. We just have a planet moving across the face of its star. So you have to be aligned so that the star, the planet crosses the face of the star as we see it. We, of course, we don't see this, but what we do measure is the change in brightness as the planet blocks out the light. So um, ge geometrically, it's very simple. And the depth of uh, the transit basically tells you the relative size of the planet compared to the star. Clearly, if the planet was smaller, the dip would be smaller. Or if the star was smaller and the planet the same size, then the dip would also be smaller. So to actually get a, a measurement of the size of the planet, you need to understand the size of your star, as we mentioned earlier on. So this is very powerful because it means the only thing you actually need to know, the only thing, is the size of the star. So you measure the radius of the planet relative to the radius of the star. But because you even see a, an eclipse going on at all, you know the inclination must be close to 90 degrees. It's in our line of sight. So that's important because that helps us if we want to go back and then look at um, uh, the, the radial velocity work because we know what I is. Uh, quickly, timing. The first planets were actually discovered from pulsar timings. So these are often neglected, but I just thought I'd mention it very quickly. So basically we have a star that's spinning, a pulsar that's spinning, sorry, a neutron star that's spinning. And neutron stars have intense magnetic fields and emit um, radiation through their polar regions. And because it's tied into the rotation of the, of the neutron star, each time a pole goes through our line of sight, we see a flash. And again, because it's rotation, it's very stable and we can actually use it as a clock. So the first planets were actually discovered looking at the times of the, of the flashes and they produced a diagram that looked like this. So far from being stable, there were small variations. I think these are in seconds here. There were small variations and those variations are actually again caused by the orbital motion of the neutron star around the center of mass in this system. I think there are three or four planets in this system as well. Interestingly enough, this can be done so accurately that most of these planets are Earth mass planets. So that's quite interesting in itself. So that's how the... ...sequence starts. So it's, it's, it's not got the same level of interest for people. Finally, I just thought I'd mention astrometry because over the next uh, couple of years, we're going to be getting some Gaia results. And I thought I'd use Sirius A, uh, the Sirius A binary, to demonstrate it. So Sirius A, Sirius is quite close to us and it has proper motion. And this dotted line represents the proper motion of the star system relative to the background. So you can imagine there should be stars all over this, this background and Sirius A is moving relative to them. And what we see, um, we see if we plot the position of Sirius A and Sirius B, which we can see because it's a white dwarf, it's faint, but we can see it, we see we can see the orbital motion. Now imagine if you can't see the B component, the white dwarf, if it was a black dwarf, we would still, it portrays its presence again because we would still see the motion of the primary. Sirius A. And over the next few years, we're going to see this from Gaia more and more that a few of these systems will be discovered. Possibly all hot Jupiters in the local environment could be discovered uh, through this route. Anyway, now we're going to talk a bit more about radial velocity. 
Um, and to do that, we're going to talk about spectra and absorption lines. And first of all, we're going to talk about how an absorption line is made. So what I've got here is an eye. This is us. We're looking this way. This is a star. And it's rotating on this side towards us and away from us on this side. So that's its motion, right? Now, if you imagine we look at one bit of the star and we, we look at, a, we take a spectrum of an absorption line, and I've shown it as upside down, just it's easier to, to understand upside down. And we see when it's coming towards us, the motion is in our light of sight, in our line of sight. So it seems to be coming towards us quite fast. And so it's blue shifted. Um, as, it, as that piece moves around, then the motion towards us gets less. When it's at this point here, it's moving across our line of sight. So at this point here, we don't see any motion at all. So it's at the rest wavelength. And then as that bit continues, on this side here, we see it moving away from us. So now it's red shifted. Now in the sun, we can actually do this experiment and we can see, because we can see the disk of the sun, we can look at different parts of the disk and we can see the rotational velocity of the sun, just like this. But in a star, we can't see the disk. And so the whole lot is crammed together and we see something that looks more like this. We see one line that is broadened and it's broadened by the rotation. Okay, so we see, we don't see the individual bits. We see the whole thing all shoved together and broadened into a, into a much wider line that betrays the rotation of, of the star. And that's what we have to work with when we're trying to measure the reflex motion of stars. We're seeing the integrated um, uh, spectra. So now we just want to talk about how that signal is measured. So this is um, a spectrum of the sun. And this is the blue end. You can see this is blue light. And each, each line here is about 60 angstroms um, of, uh, of wavelength. And it goes on. You can see all these absorption lines as you go through. And this is the red end. This is the hydrogen alpha line over here. And I guess H beta is probably something like this. I don't know. Um, but you can see there are thousands of lines here, thousands of lines. Uh, but we want to measure the most accurate velocities as the star is moving in, a, in an orbit. Because what we do know is that the stars are a lot more massive than their planets. So the re reflex motion in the star caused by the planets is going to be very small. We do know that. And I'll show you how big that is in a minute. So this is um, in intensity now. This is the hydrogen alpha region over here. So we have a strong absorption line. We have all these other uh, absorption lines. You can see we have you can see that over the whole spectrum, we actually have thousands of lines. So you could sit there and measure the exact wavelength of this and determine what its rest wavelength should be once you know what line it is. You could do that, and that would be hard work. And you'd have to do it for lots of lines and then average them together to tell you what the velocity actually is. But just to show you, this is the difficulty that we have, that this is a high resolution spectrograph here. This is a high resolution spectrum. And two of these pixels, so about the width of that line there, correspond to five kilometers per second of velocity. So just bear that in mind when we look at what kind of velocities we need. Well, I'm going to tell you now, we need to be measuring to within a thousandth of a pixel the, velocity, the, the peaks of these, of these lines. So you can see this is, not, this is not trivial. And the way we do it is to measure thousands of lines all at once. And then we get the average from all of those. And it's not a trivial thing to do. So, as I said, we're measuring the motion of the star as it orbits the center of mass uh, of the system if it has a planet. And the velocity uh, amplitude 
Um, it just depends on what kind of star and planet we have. So here's some examples, right? So let's start with this second one here. This is Jupiter. So it's a Jupiter mass object at 5 AU. So this is Jupiter. And it has, it induces reflex motion in the star of 12.7 meters per second. So remember, two, two pixels is five kilometers per second. Okay, so you can see that even measuring this is a fraction of, um, of the two pixels on the spectrograph. But if you go down this list here, you go to different kinds of objects. So this is a hot, well, not even a hot Jupiter. This is a Jupiter at one AU, and it has an amplitude of 28 meters per second. So you can see you take big masses in and the amplitude goes up, okay? But if you go to lower masses, so here we go, this is Neptune at one AU, and the semi-amplitude, the velocity amplitude, is only one and a half meters per second. And you can go down this list of different types of planets. So here's a super Earth, at five Earth masses at one AU, and it's just under half a meter per second. For the Earth-Sun system, if you could remove all the other planets, the Earth would induce um, a, um, a reflex motion of about nine, nine centimeters per second in the Sun. So this is a bit out of date now, but I just wanted to say that I guess about 20 years ago, we started making spectrographs that were capable of this level of accuracy, three to five meters per second. And that allowed us to start finding big planets and especially close in planets, big, close in big planets. As time went on, maybe about, maybe about 15, 20 years ago, we made spectrographs that can reach one meter per second. And so we could start trying to find these rocky planets that are close in. So these aren't like the Earth, they're, they're really close to their star. And if we want to find planets like the Earth that we can characterize, we need to be able to look reliably at this kind of 10 centimeter per second level. And now it is becoming feasible, I should say. Um, I don't think I've got any results to show you on that, but we'll. We can talk about it anyway. Um, here's an interesting aside, something called the Roster effect, Roster McLaughlin effect. And um, I thought I'd put this in because this is just an interesting thing. It might explain a few things that you've heard. So this is a transit now going on. And the light variations as the planet moves across the star is our transit. But what happens spectroscopically as the planet moves across the star's disk? it doesn't look like this. It's a bit more interesting than that. So we're going to start off. We're measuring the velocity of the star. And um, so this is the integrated velocity. And we see when the planet's not in front of it, it stays flat. Now, this star here, you see I've got a blue rotation towards us and a red edge where it's rotating away. The planet's moving here and the planet's going to move onto the disk. And when the planet comes on, it blocks out a bit of the blue light. So we measure then the, the full line and it's lost a bit of blue light. So it moves red. So we measure a red shift. And then as the planet moves across, when it goes across the middle, it's blocking out equal amounts of blue and red light. And then as it again moves, moves over to that, the red edge, we then see a blue line, okay? And then it comes off. So the spectroscopic signature looks a bit like this, okay? And in fact, the shape of this can tell us an awful lot. But just to show you, this is again what we're, what we're talking about now. Here's the, a big planet moving onto the disk, blocking out a bit of blue light. So the blue part of the line is getting, um, 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 removed a bit. We measure uh, the, the weight of this line and it looks a bit redder because the blue light's gone and so on and so on. Um, and so again that just shows you how that is made. But you can see the assumption that we've made here 
is that the planet is moving in the same axis that the star is rotating in. Now, if that's not the case, something interesting happens. But down here, we've got a star with an axis at this angle, and we've got a, a planet moving across at this, at this position. So you can see the orbit of the planet is inclined to the axis of rotation of the star. So when it comes on here, it blocks out um, a lot of blue light. Okay, As it moves across, it, it, it blocks out more blue light. And then as it finishes, it blocks out a little bit of red light and, uh, and uh, some more blue light. So you can see it's not following this at all. You can see most of the time it's blocking out blue light and then maybe at the end a little bit of red light. And we can actually see this. So here, these are bright planets that we can do this experiment in. So this is um, the archetypal planet uh, around HD 189733. And you can see here's our RM effect, just as predicted. But if we look at XO3, we find it looks quite different. It's got hardly any of this blue over here, maybe a little bit, but there's a big red. And that, that can be only understood if the motion of the planet looks like that. So it's heavily inclined to the rotation axis of the star. In the case of WASP-7, the planet appears to be in a polar orbit. And in the case of HAT-P7, the planet is moving in a retrograde orbit. So why is this important? Well, if you look in our solar system, all the planets are moving in, um, uh, prograde orbits, all the inner planets at least. So this tells us that something as funny has happened to these planets. Um, in fact, we know something funny has happened to these planets because you can't make a hot Jupiter, or it's difficult to make a hot Jupiter so close to its star. So these planets have somehow traveled in to their inner parts of their solar system through either a collision or, or something else. And, and you can see that the fact that these orbits are inclined that isn't traveling in through a disk. That means that they've been um, disturbed in some way. Um, and we see it. So here's the case of this is an interesting one. This, um, this is WAS 33. This is one of ours. This is a paper led by, originally by Andrew Cameron. And here, so let me just explain what we've got here. There's a load of spectra going up this way. So this is, uh, this is in time, that is. This is in spectrum that way. This is the hydrogen alpha line. And this star, WAS33, actually has some pulsations. And these black lines you can see are the pulsations going through, through the star's hydrogen alpha line. But you can also see this thing here. This is actually the shadow of the planet moving across the face of the star, blocking out the hydrogen alpha line. So very interesting, and we learn a lot about planet evolution from observations like this, but difficult. So now we're gonna move on and talk a bit about activity in the sun. Uh, relatively a quiet star compared to many, but as you all know, it has lots of activity on it. And in terms of the measurements we make, this we expect is gonna affect our observations. So just a quick recap of uh, activity on the sun? Well, we know activity is tied into magnetic fields. So this left-hand image is a magnetogram, and it shows that in each hemisphere, the north poles and the south poles lie on the same side. So this is telling us something about the model for the magnetic fields on the sun. So this is an optical image, and you don't see any, all you see are these the spots. You can also see these bright patches as well. Uh, you can't see the flares in this image, but they're all going on, they're all associated. So we know that magnetic fields are really important in stars and activity is due to some properties of the magnetic fields. And in fact, in the sun, I'm sure you've all seen uh, these beautiful sunspot uh, butterfly diagrams where you can see that the the, 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 the spots appear at the start of a cycle at high latitudes and then move to lower latitudes during the cycle. 
then disappear, and then the whole thing starts again. And the numbers also increase during this uh, phenomenon. So these are the numbers here. Right, this is a sunspot area. It's not quite the numbers, but sort of the amount of the, uh, the, the disk that's covered in spots percentage. And you can see, you may even convince yourself there's some kind of, certainly not all um, cycles are the same. Um, and we can go back through history. And of course, there's a celebrated more than minimum back in the, this 70 year period here where you can barely see any sunspots at all. And that seems to tie in with some of the most extreme winters um, uh, uh, on Earth. Um, but you can see that this cycle has continued for, for many years and is telling us something about what's going on inside the sun. It's really important that we understand this. Anyway, along with this, with all these sunspots and everything else, it also corresponds. Now, this is a much shorter period. This is just days now. It's a few hundred days here. You can see that the sun actually changes in brightness. Okay, not by very much, but when we're looking for small transits, this is this is comparable to a transit, or in fact, bigger than a Earth-sized transit. So we're going to be looking for transits of planets um, against this sort of background. And I should say this plagued Kepler as well. So um, removing this kind of motion, uh, th this kind of variations is going to be integral to whatever kind of transit detection that we, we have. So you can imagine we're trying to find transits hidden amongst this. Big transits are easy, little transits are less easy. And just to show you how, um, well, th these are light curves. This is the sun from Soho, I think it is. And this is a Kepler star. And it shows you that the sun is a relatively quiet star, but there's a, it changes the, 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 the brightness variations change as the activity increases. And some stars like this have huge levels of activity, probably lots of spots in that case. Um, and trying to find small transits against this kind of background is difficult. Um, and here's a, an example. This is real data fitted with two spot model, two spots on, on this star. Um, and you can see you can fit most variations with a couple of spots. And this is the residuals in this particular case. So we can tell, we can say something about the rotation of the star and various other things by fitting these uh, variations. Um, and in fact, if you look at sun-like stars, you find that there's quite a, quite a variation in their light curves and their periods. And it does make you ask the question, are there any quiet stars? Well, there are some quiet stars, but more than quiet, what's important is smooth variations, because smooth variations we can remove. Things that are changing quickly are much more difficult to deal with. Spectroscopically, activity is interesting. Now, this is quite new work. I should say Edinburgh, St. Andrews are involved in this as well. So this, um, this yellow uh, line here is actually data of the sun. And the blue line here is Alpha Sen B, which is quite similar to the sun, but more active. And what you do notice is that instead of having nice absorption lines, there's lots of emission lines. And this is a sure sign of activity. And if we go back to the sun then, so we hardly see anything here, but if we look closely, we can see signs of activity um, in this solar spectrum as well. Now, why this is important is because, well, let's take this thing here. So here's an absorption line. Can someone tell me if there's an emission component in there? And if there is an emission component, how does that affect the radial velocity? So the bottom line is that activity makes determining the radial velocities much more difficult, much more difficult, um, especially as these are probably varying on a pretty short time scale because things like flares and the rest of it are changing on a short time scale as well. And so you see this when you look at um, 
uh, activity signal, when you look at radial velocity signatures in active stars, you find that the, the radial velocities are all over the place because you just can't measure them very accurately because the line shapes are changing. Now, there is work that will help with this, but I'll, which I'll get onto uh, later on. So um, the next question is, what are the effects on the spectrum of the different, act well, what causes the, the different kinds of activity? Well, I'm just gonna list them here and then we'll look at them in more detail. So the first is convection. So this is just like when you boil a kettle, you look at it and you see uh, bubbles moving up and down or moving up in the, in the kettle. Well, we see the same thing on the sun. We see convection cells on the sun, which I'll show you in a minute. We see spots on the sun. We will, they will be on other stars. I should say that we can see the, the convection cells on the sun. Um, they're probably different on other stars. Depends how, how cool the star is. Maybe they're much bigger than they are uh, for cooler stars, um, or much bigger than they are on the sun with cooler stars. And the same with spots. Uh, we've only got the sun to go on, but we can we have an idea from other from from uh, indirect means what they're like on other stars. We know that magnetic fields are important as well. So anyway, so here's um here's a little image of the sun. This is a uh, thousand by thousand kilometers, and it's uh, a pile of images over one hour, and you can see the evolution of the of the convective cells on the sun. And you can see that they're sort of like, um, um, well, what you can see here are white things and black lines in between the white thing. In actual fact, what, we, what we're really seeing, these are the tops of convective cells. The white bits are the material coming up. And then it cools and it falls back into the interior of the sun through the dark bits, okay? So the hot material comes up from the deeper areas, that's the bright bits, and then it cools and then goes down these lanes, the dark, the dark lanes in between the convective cells. So the cells just last a, a few minutes each. And these are convective cells. All right, so these are not so easy to understand, but I hope you'll, you'll get a, an idea of what we're talking about here. So this is our star again. And what we're gonna try and understand is what a spectral line really looks like when we look at it in detail. So the first thing is, let's think about those convective cells. So they're pretty bright. So we would expect to see quite a lot of it and they're, and they're coming towards us. Remember they're coming up. So they're slightly blue shifted. And this is a spectrum of those blue shifted convective cells. The dark lanes are, are, are going back down again. So these are red shifted. And then just um, because of the way the physics works in the atmospheres of these stars, um, the actual core of the, of the line is actually formed in the atmosphere further up. So the, the thing that we see, the absorption line we see, is actually composed of all of these things shoved together. And you can see it won't be a nice shape. It's got you know, a lump in the wing here. It's got a slightly blue shifted component here compared to this central line here. So the overall line is slightly um, bent bluewards, and we call that the convective blue shift. And the center of the line, um, because of this uh, intergranular absorption thing here gets bent inwards. The line isn't symmetric at all. That's the bottom line. They're not nicely shaped lines, but the shape of the line tells us something about the convection and also something about um, the, the velocities that are involved in the convection and the, the, the areas in between convective cells. Now, if we add in a spot here, then, um, what we see here is uh, the, the rotation profile is again distorted. So here we have no spots. This is what happens when we do have a spot. 
So when we add them together, the, the red part of the line is again, sorry, the blue part of the line, sorry, the red part of the line is suppressed because there's less light coming from the spots. Okay, so you can see the line is again distorted. Okay, that's our, and then the last thing uh, is when you have uh, an active area like this, the whole region is quite magnetic and that suppresses the convection. We don't see around um, spots, we don't see the same signs of convection that we would normally see. So he heavily active stars have less signs of convection in them. Anyway, you can put this all together and you can see we've got quite a complicated effect going on that we really do need to try and understand to model because the line is much more complicated than just a straightforward Doppler shifted line. Well, it is Doppler shifted, it's just that there are these other components that are added to that uh, absorption line. Now, I just thought I'd put this in because this is, this is just a brilliant diagram, right? And the way to look at this is we have wavelength here. And then over here, we have increasing magnetic field. So if we start right down here, okay? Uh, and what we have here, these, these lines represent um, hydrogen lines, or rather the wavelength of hydrogen lines. So when there's a very low magne magnetic field, we have um, effectively a single hydrogen alpha line and a single hydrogen beta line. But as we increase the magnetic field, then the energy levels around the nucleus, around the proton in a hydrogen uh, atom become distorted and they start breaking up. So when you have a field of 10 Tesla, 10,000 10, uh, Tesla over here, um, you can see that the hydrogen line, hydrogen alpha line is now composed of three separate lines separated by a few hundred angstroms. And then as you wind up the magnetic field even more, these lines just break into lots of components. And so you see hundreds of components of the, of the hydrogen, atom, of hydrogen alpha and beta and gamma. So the spectra for a very highly magnetized star looks really complicated. And here's an example. Um, so this top one is a magnetic um, cataclysmic variable. And this is a model here, and I think the, I think it's a twenty thousand, oops, I think it's a twenty thousand Gauss, uh, mo a Tesla model. So here's the hydrogen alpha. The hydrogen alpha is split into these multiple components. This is in the model, and this is actually what we see. So we can we can say that there must be a huge magnetic field on this star, much greater than than on the Earth. Uh, and lastly, the other thing I just want to quickly mention before I start running out of time is that if a star is pulsating, and most stars do pulsate, or most sunlight stars pulsate, um, then you can see there's stuff, move, material moving towards us and other material moving away. Okay, so depending on what, and these models here are all the kind of pulsations we see in the sun. Okay, they're greatly exaggerated, but we see these pulsations, we can measure them. And so they all have a signature that's hidden in, in the Doppler measurements. And remember, we're trying to reach nine centimeters per second. So any kind of effect, even like this, we, is gonna pollute our, our, answer, our uh, measurements. So what does this actually mean in the end? So from the point of view of transit detection, so this is photometry, increased activity makes it difficult to detect a transit. That's obvious. If you keep the activity uh, level constant, then the activity makes detecting smaller and smaller planets difficult. There have been a number of small planets announced that turn out to be activity signals. It's difficult. Um, the way around it, Yes, yeah, so activity can mask transits of small planets. The way around it is to just observe a lot more transits. So instead of observing for one year, you observe for five years, that sort of thing. 
but still, it's still very difficult to do. And it causes real pressure on any kind of observational strategy you have. What does it mean for the radial velocity, the spectroscopic measurements? <coughs> well, the activity distorts some of the absorption lines, not all of them, but some of them. And so, again, as you go to um, as you what well, as you go to smaller planets, lower mass planets, then the distortion becomes more significant because you're trying to measure smaller and smaller velocities. So activity is a is a is a way to mask the presence of small planets as well. Or at least you can detect them through the transit, but you can't characterize them, i.e., get their masses and densities through a, a velocity measurement. Also, um, you can't, it's much more difficult to measure uh, the orbital motion um, if you've got activity uh, polluting the, the lines. So there are ways around this that are only starting to be applied now. There's a there's a, a nut cracker way, a hammer cracking the nut, where you just take lots of observations, and you kind of average out the activity signal. That works, but it's just expensive. A better solution would be to try and model the activity, um, and there's a lot of work going on to do this. Um, the downside is that the activity timescales range from just minutes to for years, like in the case of the sun, we've got, we know of mag the magnetic cycle, which is 11 or 22 years. So activity timescales are, are, need to be better understood. So how do we measure 10 centimeters per second? Well, as I said, the first spectrographs that are stable enough to make these kind of measurements are now being used. And the best one is the Espresso instrument at Paranal in Chile. But overall, these are big instruments. There will never be many of these instruments in the world. So we need to make sure that they're used in the most efficient way. Espresso itself can be fed from any of the four VLTs. It's fed through a fiber. So it's, it makes good use of the time when the telescopes are in between other observations. So we can, um, um, we can average observations, but you need a lot of data. And so to give you an idea, to do an Earth-Sun analog um, with an Earth at about ninth magnitude, you need a total of about 33 nights of eight meter time. That is a lot of data for one particular object. So as I said, there's a lot of people trying to figure out which lines are contaminated. And can we produce templates that just use uncontaminated lines to measure the velocity? It's difficult, but it's going to be possible, I'm sure. The other thing is that people have started to work more at infrared wavelengths because there's a feeling that the activity signals are lower at the infrared. In And also um, the activity signals are lower and uh, the radial velocity signals are bigger at those longer wavelengths. So it's one of these things that in principle looks easier. In practice, measurements in the infrared are really difficult, especially from the ground because the atmosphere is changing all the time. But anyway, people are working on it. So now I'm gonna mention Plato. So Plato, uh, so I'm the, um, the, the science coordinator for the mission. It's, um, it's designed to detect habitable zone uh, rocky planets. And in fact, we have measured, everything we do is measured in terms of earth analogs. How many earth analogs can we measure? This kind of thing. Um, uh, and what we, the idea behind Plato is to measure accurate planetary radiuses, masses, densities, and ages as well. So that means we need to understand the stars pretty, pretty well. And also to really make a big dent in this, to do uh, loads of objects, 
which we need for our statistics, then I think that understanding or at least correcting the activity is going to be important. But it's not trivial to do. Um, in all our, all our documents, we've just talked about the averaging technique. So um, that's why we need hundreds of VLT nights to do this project. But we're hopeful, and things have improved since we made those measurements, that we can start to model out these activity signals and therefore get much cleaner velocities um, and therefore characterize the planets better. So as I said, the original estimates reckon that um, 400 nights of telescope time could be available and we would be able to do 10 Earth analogs. Now, I know that sounds frightening, but you should see it in this context. Right now, there are zero that have been done. So even doing, even doing one would be an important um, step forward. But this is expensive, and we're not going to get to do this experiment often. So we want to make the best we can, and that means understanding the activity levels better. It would just be more efficient, allow more characterized planets. And if we can characterize planets, this is Plato, by the way, a, a recent rendition of Plato, then we can actually get ages of planets and sizes of planets with more accuracy than has ever been done. And so in terms of atmospheres, for instance, we know that the Earth's atmosphere has changed over the years, over the eons rather, um, but we'll be able to, for the first time, see if we can see evolutionary changes in atmospheres of these planets. Well, Plato won't do that, but it will provide planets with ages. And if we can measure their atmospheres, then we'll be able to say something about evolutionary changes in terrestrial planet atmospheres. And that's it. Thank you very much for that, Don. That's fascinating. But before we move on to questions, can we all unmute and thank Don for his talk? I, I've got a quick question. You, you touched briefly on atmospheres there. Obviously, there's, there's quite a lot of stuff going on with um, exoplanet atmospheres. We've had a, some talks about that as well. Presumably, um, these complex spectra and um, active stars is going to make it um, <laughs> several orders of magnitude more complex to, to understand the atmospheres. It nice is that. even more difficult for atmospheric work, more difficult. And that's, for, that's, that's because of a number of reasons. The, the features, the atmospheric features you're looking at or looking for are pretty faint. And so um, if you have any changes in your stellar spectrum, because that's invariably how this is done through transmission. And that means comparing the spectrum of the star during the transit to the outer transit. Then if you have any changes due to activity, then you're going to be looking at, at uh, imaginary features. So it is really, I'm not saying it's impossible, it's really difficult. And it gets even more difficult because a lot of um, talk at the moment is looking at, at um, stars or transits that you can't, you can't get the data in one transit to the atmosphere. So they're talking about summing together maybe 20 transits. And so if you've got, again, uh, uh, there's so much opportunity for variations in the stellar spectrum in that time that it makes it really, it's a really difficult thing to do. But, you know, science is difficult and there are many things that we've done that have been wrong, but that's okay. It's okay to get things wrong in science because it just makes you try and do things better the next time. Okay, um, if you've got questions, put them in the, in the Zoom chat and, and Jim will um, get you to call them out. Jim, do you want to take over? And find yeah, out? Um, we've just got one question at the moment. So if anyone's got any others, they can pop them there before we head over to, to YouTube. So uh, John Murrell has a question. So if you'd like to unmute John, you can ask away. Yeah, thanks very much for the talk, very interesting. Um, it's very similar in some ways, the one that was given to the AA VSO a couple of weeks ago where that was looking at the um, sunspots and the effect of those or the star spots. 
my question is, I believe that ESO were using the HARP spectroscope to actually look for the um, planets in the solar system with a very small telescope stuck on the side of the, um, no, one no. Of the telescopes there. But I haven't seen any results from it. I just wondered if you'd heard anything or not. Yeah, so there's, um, there's some data sets being released actually looking at the sun. Mm. And they, they uh, I mean, it's been very interesting because there's a lot of corrections you have to make to the data. And it is an incredibly difficult thing to do in this experiment. I mean, firstly, as I said, when you have a single planet, it's hard. And when you have multiple planets, mm. the way it works is that in our solar system, anything you would see would be dominated by Jupiter, mm. right? Uh, yep. And then you would have to remove that signal, and then you would see Saturn's signal. Mm. So you're continually removing signals. In the case of the solar uh, telescope using HARPS, well, HARPS itself has an accuracy of maybe a meter per second, right? Mm. Maybe better than that, but the signals are dominated. Once you get down to half meter set per second, you start being dominated by activity, even in the sun. Mm. So um, anything, and of course, down at half meter per second, um, I think that's most of the planets were that size or less. Mm. In fact, and, less. So, yeah, so yeah. They're, they're not visible in the data because mm. we can't treat the data well enough at the moment. And you've got to wait quite a few years as well to get a uh, get the other the shifts because yeah, the other other planets thing. take a long while to go around, don't they, the outer ones? I mean, Thank so you. the HARPS instrument itself is capable of, say, half a metre per second. In the mm. best cases, um, but um, you need to gather enough data, right? Uh, you need to be able to correct <coughs> what data you've got for activity signals. And the great thing about that data set is that it's helping us understand how to do it. Mm. So I think those data sets have led to a much greater understanding. In fact, the spectra I showed you of the sun compared to Alpha Sen B they were taken with that instrument. Mm. Mm, thank you. Um, it's also their smallest telescope, I believe, at four inches. I have no idea. Something like that, yes. They've got enough photons, they don't need any more. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we've had another question from Neil Martin. So do you want to ask Neil? Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Professor, that was fascinating. Um, yeah, fascinating. Um, and apologies for asking a discovery question. <laughs> um, but are there any new detection methods on the horizon? Uh, and if so, do we need new methods or just um, better, detector, better detectors? I think um, that's a good question. I mean, I, the next few years, I think, at least in principle, are going to be dominated by astrometry. And that's the Gaia results, basically. The Gaia is busy producing these very good astrometric positions. And so from that, you'll be able to see the motion in the star caused by a planet. And I think it's mostly sensitive to big planets. So we'll have a good census of, at least in the local uh, space, of Jupiter's um, nearby, at least. Um, do we need any, any additional methods? So the thing about discovery is that all the methods um, are actually um, sensitive to slightly different kinds of planet. So um, if you look at uh, microlensing, for instance, that is extremely good at looking at um, planets not in our local neighborhood and um, a relatively long period, low mass planets. So you can see uh, those sort of planets across the galaxy. Of course, you can only use it for statistics for microlensing because you you have a light curve, you solve the light curve, and the light, and you and you predict what planet has caused that um, anomaly in the light curve. But it's it's maybe the only way to do that. Um, radial velocities and transits complement each other. Pretty well. Timing is only really used on 
things that you can time accurately. So the pulsars are great because you can measure those times to a fraction of a second, uh, but you can't see them spectros spectroscopically. So, you know, you wouldn't use, I think it just depends what you want to do as to how you do it. So. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And uh, we have a, a comment, I think, more than a question from Will Joy, although I, I don't know, are we handing over to you, Will, for YouTube as well? Um, yes, we can. I, I'll just start my little 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 question there, if, if that's us, us done. Um, just just a quick one. E excellent talk there, uh, Professor uh, Blosio. Um, I just wondered myself, um, I was very impressed with that little short one hour video of the um, convection cells on the sun. And I just wondered very briefly how much they are slowed when we have big sunspots available. Is it is it sort of a matter of well, minutes to hours? Or no, I mean, if there's a sunspot, then the convection is completely disrupted. I mean, you, you imagine those pictures of sunspots. Uh, wherever the sunspot, the umbra and the penumbra is, you don't see any of these cells. So the magnetic field disrupts them completely. It doesn't slow them. It just disrupts them. Okay, so, so if you have um, part of the sun, part of the surface of the star that has a lot of spots on it, then all the convective cells in those areas are just gone. Gone. Excellent. Okay, that's um, that's, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Now, uh, before we hand over, Will, uh, we've had another question from Nigel Goodman. So perhaps we, Nigel, we could just go to you first. Uh, yeah, just just quickly. I mean, uh, it seems to me that the the, the search for rocky planets uh, is uh, is one of the aspects of, of looking for life elsewhere in the universe and I just wondered if there were any other markers for possible life or the um, uh, for, for the likelihood of life that you would be looking for once a, a rocky planet has been discovered in the right zone from it, uh, uh, from its, its host star so um, I mean biomarkers which is what you're asking about is a really interesting question. And well, over the next few years, I mean, we have TESS flying at the moment and TESS is finding some habitable zone um, uh, rocky planets, not many, but some. And I've no doubt they're gonna be looked at very carefully. Most of them are, are have captured rotation, but there'll be a lot of work done with these, I'm sure. And sooner or later, people will start trying to make claims of detection of life. And I think people will do it because um, if they can just say it and it turns out to be true, they'll have this, their name on this great discovery. <laughs> uh, um, not that I would care, but anyway. Um, um, so, but I'm sure this is going to come. It, it happened in the early days of the exoplanet work. There was, there was a huge scrum down discovering planets. It was actually embarrassing, to tell you the truth. Um, and it's just because the currency at that time of a planet detection was huge. I mean, if you've only got, well, let me give you an example. When, um, when we started Super Wasp, Wasp 1 and 2, at what, when, what, when we announced Wasp 1 and 2, there were 14 transiting planets known. was a space where this discovery was announced and it totally disrupted the meeting. Um, now that kind of currency is well gone and I think it's healthy that it has gone and now we're looking more at statistics and things like that to try and understand things a lot better. I think the next scrum down is going to be in the life question. In my view, you're not going to like this, the easiest life to detect will be from the civilizations that pollute their atmospheres the most. If you have atmospheres that, that have things that can't be made by natural means, then it will be a, 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 a pretty good indicator that there has been at least life there. But it's not a very pleasant thought. No. <laughs> Thank you. He likes it, Dina. Okay, Mark, that's the, the Zoom contributions. Okay, Will, I think probably got time for one question through YouTube if there is, if there is one. Um, yep, 
Okay, just um, very quick, just had uh, people from India to Iran to USA, basically worldwide viewing here, so excellent. Um, from um, Empowered, we've got, it's sort of a, a deep question here, what percentage of total planets that we expect are missed in transit detection because we are not in the plane of the orbit? Do we expect, you know? So well, it's, it's quite many, a difficult thing to Many, many, with. many, many. The transit, I mean, it depends on, on how, on the periods. When you go out to, um, let's take an Earth example, an Earth-Sun system, to detect one Earth-Sun system in transit, you probably need somewhere near 200 systems. 199 of them will not transit. And that's because you can imagine as you go further away from the star, then the likelihood of that alignment occurring gets smaller and smaller. In the case of a hot Jupiter, it's so close in and it's so big, the likelihood of transiting is about 5%. But you've got to put that, I mean, I know that sounds terrible, and that's why transit surveys have to look at so many stars. But show me another way to measure the size of a planet. There isn't one. And the great thing about the transit the scientific payoff is really high. You can actually make accurate measurements. And of course, once you know the inclination, which only occurs for a transit, then you can solve all the mass equations as well. So you don't measure m sine i, you measure mass of planet. So if you want to know anything about a planet itself, then right now, the only ones you can say anything certain about are transiting planets. They're high currency. Excellent, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think we should probably stop the questions there, but thank you again. Can we thank Don again for his talk? It's brilliant, thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay, now, now we move on to the sky in September. Alan, over to you. Uh, this is from a very Scottish perspective, so all our international audience, um, you can, it, it applies to you, but it may be slightly different ways. Maybe not in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> you, Thanks, Mark. I'm going to try and share my screen. Right, I hope you can see that now. Yes, we've got that, thanks. Okay, right. Uh, and bring up pointer, as you can see that. Okay, Sky in September 2021, when I last spoke to you, it was in July, and there hasn't been a big change since then. We've got the same planets round, and even when it gets dark, we've got a similar sort of uh, sky to look at. But uh, here we'll set off with this uh, lovely image taken by Pat Devine of the Lobster Claw Nebula. This was taken last Friday, uh, August 27, and it's an emission nebula uh, in Cassiopeia on the border with Cepheus. And it's not far from the Bubble Nebula, which I've displayed before now, and it's not far from where a nova was discovered uh, earlier this year. That nova, Nova Cassiopeia 2021, has been fluctuating up and down in brightness ever since it was first spotted in March. Uh, as of yesterday, it was still visible through binoculars, uh, just fainter than magnitude eight. And it's been uh, brighter than magnitude six as recently as July, the end of July. This uh, nebula, the lobster claw nebula, for obvious reasons, looks a bit like a lobster claw. Alongside it, there is a, a, a star cluster, NGC 7510. Uh, the star cluster is 11,400 light years from us, about the same distance as the gas that makes up the claw. Now, since I last spoke, of course, we've had the Perseids meteor shower that peaked uh, on the night of August 12th to 13th, and uh, several members of the society travelled to Yellow Craigs Park to the west, to the east of Edinburgh, west of North Berwick in, in Scotland, to observe uh, on that night and uh, here are a couple, a few Im images uh, posted on the ASE Flickr page uh, on, on that night of Perseid meteors. Uh, the first by Jonathan Anderson shows the meteor uh, here. Um, the brightest star 
just at the top there is, is uh, Polaris, Pole Star, and you can see the rest of Ursa Minor uh, to the left of the diagram. Uh, Ramsey McIver got this shot of a Perseid uh, to the uh, west, to the, the west side of the square of Pegasus, which is down here. This is the Summer Triangle, Vega, Deneb, and Altair on that side of the diagram. And uh, Ian Smith produced several photographs, including this one, where the, the bright Perseid meteor is just miss, missing a collision uh, with the uh, Andromeda galaxy. And if you look carefully, there's a second short dash of a Perseid just where my pointer is now. Uh, so uh, Ian produced several uh, images of Perseids. And as everyone who was taking images that night probably noticed, they were also capturing images of satellites because they were also out in abundance. Anyway, back to the night sky for the September. And this is the view that uh, I have in, in the star charts that appear with my night sky notes uh, in the Scotsman newspaper and on the ASC webpage. Uh, whole sky charts, uh, views to the north and the south. The horizontal line at the base of each hemisphere is uh, the horizon. And this is the line that stretches from west to east in, in for the northern map and from west to east uh, for the southern map. Uh, features on the chart, uh, the plough I always pick out, it's now dipping down below Polaris in the northern sky as seen from, uh, from Scotland. And Cassiopeia, uh, the W of Cassiopeia is climbing up in the northeast. In the south, we've got the Summer Triangle, a bit squashed on this presentation. We've also got coming up in the southeast, the square of Pegasus. And we've got a number of planets. The brightest and the most obvious object in the sky, if the moon's not there, is Jupiter, which is down there coming up towards the meridian at these times. Not far away to its west, a bit south is, is Saturn. Uh, still quite bright to the naked eye, but not visible to the naked eye is the, dist the most distant planet, Neptune, which does reach opposition um, uh, this month when it stands directly opposite the sun in the sky. There's a further planet visible through binoculars and that's Uranus, which is over here, low down in the east. And I won't say a great deal about that. As far as the sun goes, those are the times of sunrise, sunset and the twilight times uh, for the sun this month. Um, twilight times, uh, if you look at them in, uh, carefully, you'll notice that we're in, enjoying an increasing period of, of true darkness by the end of the month. Astronomical darkness, when the sun is 18 degrees below the horizon, lasts for more than eight hours uh, each night. The sun crosses southwards over the equator on the 22nd, and we have that marks the autumnal equinox when nights are roughly equal wherever you are on days and nights are roughly equal wherever you are around the Earth. The moon's phases, well. Uh, the early part of the month is the period when the moon's out of the way, uh, so we're currently enjoying some dark skies for much of the night. Then the moon comes round again and we have a full moon on the 21st. I say the 21st, uh, it's actually on 23.55 GMT on the 20th, but because we're on BST, that shifts the actual moment of full moon uh, onto the 21st. You'll find lots of references saying the full moon's on the 20th, but it's actually on the 21st. And this year, uh, that is our harvest moon. The full moon closest to the autumnal equinox uh, is our harvest moon. Before I go on to look at planets uh, and stars, let's take a look at what's happening on the images in our Flickr group by members. Uh, this Peter Black's photograph of the sun shows a number of sunspots. The number of sunspots is starting to increase. Uh, we're starting to pull away from the period of, of very, very low sunspot activity during sunspot minimum. And then we have some images of the moon by Fran Goodman, Radim Stano uh, and Nigel Goodman. Um, they're uh, all taken from our Flickr group. There are so many images on our Flickr group uh, in the last month or two, it's absolutely impossible to show them all in this talk. It lasts far too long. Uh, the planets for September, well, this is a band showing 360 degrees of the equatorial regions of the sky, stretching right way around the sky with the sun in this case in the middle and the part of the sky which we don't see because of daylight. The sun this month is moving uh, from Leo into Virgo, 
crossing the equator of the sky at the equinox. Jupiter and Saturn are over here in, into the evening sky. They've now passed opposition. And these are the, the correct four relative sizes of those two planets. Uh, we also have Venus, but only just uh, visible in, in the evening twilight, quite a bit southeast of the sun, but very low in, our, in Scotland's evening twilight. If you're in countries uh, nearer the equator, you have a brilliant view of Venus in the western sky uh, at nightfall. But for, for us, it really is stuck in the twilight. Mercury for us is uh, even closer to the sun and it's not going to be visible from Scotland this month. It's farthest away from the sun, actually 27 degrees east of the sun on the 14th of September. Mars, well, it's not visible at all. It's in conjunction on the far side of the sun on October the 8th. It's just lost in the solar glare. And finally here, I mentioned Neptune, which is uh, at opposition, opposition on the 14th in the constellation of Aquarius. Here's the view looking northwards at uh, 22 hours in the middle of the month and at these times at other, uh, other dates. I'll point out the plow is, is here, Cassiopeia here, the Milky Way is falling down from the zenith, but not very bright over this stretch between to the below Cassiopeia in the, in the northeast. And the Milky Way's axis, if you like, points uh, stretches down past the bright star Capella in the northeast, which and that star is getting higher during the night. Turning to the west, this is a view west at the same time, uh, at the same times. Uh, here's the plough uh, in the northeast, uh, northwest rather, the arc to Arcturus trick to reach the brightest star in the northern half of the sky, Arcturus, in the constellation of Bootes. Uh, that's now uh, in the north, uh, in, the, in the west, low down in the west. And the Milky Way is falling towards the southwest from overhead, and it's getting brighter as it does so as it heads down towards Sagittarius down here in the center of our Milky Way galaxy. But before we leave the west, I want to look at the position of Venus in our sky. This is the view from Edinburgh, 30 minutes after sunset, looking to the west-southwest uh, on the 1st, 16th of September and October the 1st. And you can see Venus here. You'll not be able to, at this time to see any stars uh, though the constellations are marked for your benefit. And also there's, there's a, just where my pointer is now, is the star Spica, the brightest star in Virgo. And Venus is passing quite close to that, that in the next few days. Uh, but Venus is staying, hugging the horizon at, uh, in the early part, very early part of the evening. Um, it's still a gibbous object, uh, it, but getting bigger. Um, uh, and uh, as I say, it's passing quite close to uh, Spica in Virgo, but Virgo is five magnitudes fainter than Venus, uh, which is a hundred times fainter than Venus precisely. So you're not going to see uh, Spica at all easily. On September the 9th, though, uh, the moon is in the area. This is the view uh, September the 9th, expanded somewhat, so this is only five degrees above the horizon. There's the moon, there's uh, Venus. The moon is six degrees above um, and to the left, uh, to the right of Venus. And following night, it's uh, eight degrees above and to the, uh, sorry, above and to the right of Venus, eight degrees above and to the left of Venus the following night. So this, if you can find the moon in the twilight, that gives you a, a chance, a guide for finding also Venus. You're not gonna see Mercury, which even half an hour after sunset as seen from Edinburgh is already below the horizon. So you're not gonna see Mercury. But uh, if we just consider the objects close to the sun and interior to the Earth's orbit, on August the 13th, uh, Scott Shepard, uh, an astronomer, discovered a uh, fast moving an asteroid that's in an orbit that takes it very close to the sun. He was using a 570 megapixel camera, a dark energy camera on the Victor M. Blanco telescope at Cerro Tololo in Chile. Um, the orbit of this asteroid takes 113 days to go around the sun. So it's a longer period orbit than Mercury, which is 88 days. But dur during the course of its orbit, it dips within 20.4 million kilometers of the sun at its closest at perihelion, when its surface temperature of its rocks would, should reach about 480 degrees uh, Celsius. The orbit is quite well inclined to the uh, sun's equator, 32 degrees around. 
and it belongs to the Atira class of asteroids, which have orbits entirely inside that of the Earth. Um, it was found uh, when it was uh, just after Aphelion, the farthest point from the Sun, and it's only about one kilometre across. What is it? Well, it may be a dormant comet nucleus uh, or an asteroid captured from further out. It perhaps is a so-called uh, rock comet like Phaethon, um, which is the parent asteroid of the Geminids meteor shower in December. Uh, Phaethon is, is much uh, bigger. It's 5.8 kilometres across and takes four, 524 days uh, to, to go around the sun. Uh, its perihelion is at 20.9 million kilometers, but its aphelion is well outside the orbit of Mars. And if you talk about the, look at the orbit of this new asteroid, the fastest moving asteroid that we know of when it's in perihelion, uh, there's, the, there's the orbit of the asteroid. Uh, these positions of, for the planets, Mars, the Earth and, and Venus are correct for August the 21st. Uh, if you project the asteroid's orbit forwards, then next October the 26th next year, it's going to pass 2.9 million kilometers from Venus. And it's thought that uh, encounters like that will eventually kick this asteroid out of the inner solar system altogether or cause it to collide with one, with one of the planets. Let's look south at our mid-evening times, mid-month. Uh, and uh, I always like to point out the summer triangle. Uh, Vega, Deneb and Altair, and the square of Pegasus uh, over here in the southeast. Um, and also, let's move, point out the teapot of Sagittarius. This is uh, setting in the south-southwest at these times, but earlier in the evening as darkness falls, it's at its best uh, due south uh, at, the, at the end of nautical twilight. Uh, Call the teapot because it look, has the more or less shape of a teapot and it's, quite, it's alongside a bright section of the Milky Way, though, of course, from, from Scotland, uh, we don't get a very good view of this part of the, of the Milky Way. But what we do get, have a view of at the moment is Capricornus, uh, the constellation, and two obvious planets. So let's take a look at that in close up. This is the moon uh, plotted um, double its size, if you like, uh, on the diagram, plotted for that time on the 16th of, of September. Let's ignore it for now. The conspicuous planet uh, and the most conspicuous object in the sky, if the moon isn't around, is, is Jupiter, uh, which is moving to the west in this direction on the edge of Capricornus. And uh, that's its motion uh, during the course of the month. Um, and if you look at it uh, through the telescope, that's about the view you get. It's magnitude minus 2.8, brighter than any star. It's 49 arc seconds in diameter at, at mid-month. And if you look at it through a telescope, you'll see uh, the four main Galilean moons, which you can just about see if you have uh, binoculars and you manage to mount them or hold them extremely steady. Um, and telescopes can also sh show the um, uh, shadows of the moons crossing the disk of Jupiter, as, as they sometimes do. Saturn is considerably fainter. It's a, a brightness about the same, uh, somewhere between that of Altair and Vega. And that's its motion during the month, not quite as quickly, but it's still going in a retrograde, in other words, westerly direction. Um, and this is what it appears like through a telescope. Several of the main moons of Saturn uh, can now be viewed telescopically. And now that Saturn's passed opposition, the sunlight is striking it not directly from behind us. And you can see the shadow of uh, the globe of Saturn falling on the rings beyond Saturn. And here are some pictures by Radim Stano of, of, um, of those two planets taken in the last uh, month or so. Uh, you can see on the photograph of Jupiter, the red spot is visible and uh, on this image, He's picked up, there are, in this case, three moons showing. Uh, and uh, for Saturn, well, there's one, two, three, four, five moons visible uh, for Saturn. Back to this uh, chart of Capricornus and the two giant planets, I wanted to point out an often neglected deep sky object here, which is there, called Messier 30, sometimes called the jellyfish cluster. When I first prepared this uh, uh, this, uh, this, this presentation, I couldn't find any images of the jellyfish cluster taken by members. This is a NASA ESA image of the jellyfish cluster. It's not so obvious to me why it's called the jellyfish cluster. 
Um, it's a bit south for us, so I thought maybe our astrophotographers are not, not been uh, interested in photographing it. And then our intrepid colleague, Hugh Somerville, posted a very recent image taken on the 27th of August of the jellyfish cluster. And it suddenly struck me why it's called a jellyfish cluster. It looks a bit like a jellyfish with, tank, uh, with tentacles hanging down uh, from, from the jellyfish. Now let's look at the moon's progress uh, through Capricornus. Uh, this is the moon on the 16th. On the 17th, it's down here below the line joining uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And then on the 18th, it's over here to the east, uh, to the east of Jupiter, south and east of Jupiter. I also want to take a look at uh, a couple of stars here, Al Gedi and Davi, uh, respectively Alpha and Beta uh, in Capricornus. Uh, and I'll look at this area in close up, and you can now see that both those stars are naked eye double stars. Al Gedi more so than Davi. You may need decent eyesight to spot Davi as a double, but Al Gedi is more obviously a double star. In fact, it's two yellow giant stars. Um, they're not physically connected. In fact, the brighter of the two is 106 light years from us, and the fainter one is 690 light years thereabouts from us. So that it's visible in the sky as an optical double star, but they're not physically uh, connected. Dabby, though, it's thought the stars there are uh, connected. Uh, the two stars there lie around 330 light years from us, and the two stars probably orbit each other in around a million years. Uh, so we have yet to see a complete orbit of the two stars. The brighter one is actually a triple star, uh, while the fainter one is a binary. And there are two other dim stars nearby, which may belong to the same gravitational system. So it's certainly a multiple star. Return to the wider view in the south and below the square of Pegasus, uh, you can see uh, a little pattern of stars a circle of stars called the circlet of Pisces. It represents the head of one of the two fishes that make up Pisces. Uh, the other uh, head is uh, to the uh, uh, east of, of, of the square, to the left of the square of Pegasus, just below Andromeda. And the circlet of Pisces is, lies quite close to where the sun is at the time of the spring or the vernal equinox. The sun's at that time is around well, where my pointer is now. So let's look at this region uh, in, in more detail because there are a couple of objects I want to point out uh, here. Uh, this is that same region, the square of Pegasus is off the screen at the top. Circlet of Pisces, um, five, five or six stars uh, forming a pattern, a uh, circular pattern. The first object I want to point out is Neptune, uh, which is opposition on the 14th when it's 4,326 million kilometers from us. And uh, this is the uh, a view that you might have through a telescope of Neptune, uh, a bluish disk, only 2.3 seconds of arc in diameter, magnitude 7.8. And uh, if you can see down to magnitude 13.4, then you might spot the, its main moon, Triton. The other object I want to pick out is the asteroid Pallas, which lies just there. It's fainter uh, than Neptune. Uh, uh, Neptune is magnitude 7.8, Pallas is magnitude 8.6. Uh, and it's at opposition on September the 11th at a distance of 321 million kilometers. And if you compare Pallas with the other largest asteroids, these are the four largest asteroids. It's number three in terms of size. It's number two in term, terms of discovery. It's 512 kilometers across. Um, it's similar in composition, it's thought to Ceres, uh, carbonaceous chondrite, possibly uh, lower density, uh, rocky uh, uh, asteroid. And uh, it's an orbit which is, uh, takes 4.6 years to go around the sun. And if you plot the motions of those two objects over the course of September and through to the middle of October, you see Pallas is, is heading in this direction. The, the dots here are at uh, intervals of every five days, whereas the dots down here for the slower motion of Neptune are at every 15 days. These uh, illustrations and these images are all, these maps are, are all generated by Stellarium software. Uh, 
you can get the similar sorts of things from other comparable planetarium programs, but Stellarium being for PCs and, and Macs, at least it's free uh, and you can use it to display your own charts for any time and at any scale. <clears throat> Let's turn our attention to the east and the uh, final one of the visible planets this month is Uranus, which is down here, more or less below uh, uh, the bright star or the second magnitude star Hamel in the constellation of Aries. It's, uh, Uranus is uh, 12 degrees below uh, Hamel and it's magnitude 5.7. So uh, you will be able to see it with an naked eye on a good clear night. It's very easy to spot uh, through binoculars. Uh, again, you can probably bring up bring up a better chart than, than I can show here. Of course, the main feature uh, in this part of the sky is in the constellation Andromeda, and that's Stellar M2 of, of Andromeda. And even on the star charting program Andromeda, uh, Stellarium, you can see uh, the Andromeda galaxy uh, M31, the largest bright, uh, largest, the nearest large galaxy uh, to our own. Of course, it lies two and a half million light years away. And Pat Devine has produced this image recently uh, on August the 14th, in fact, of uh, M31. If you notice, uh, there are other galaxies visible here, satellite galaxies. M32 is this body alongside the Andromeda galaxy and a bit further away from the center is uh, M110. And you can also notice dark lanes of, of obscuration caused by dust in the plane of the galaxy. The galaxy contains around 200, sorry, it's 220,000 light years across, and it's got a mass around a trillion suns, uh, making it a bit larger uh, and a bit more massive than our Milky Way galaxy. Sticking to the eastern sky, I've run the clock forward to five o'clock in the morning at mid month, and this is the view before dawn. Uh, the Milky Way by then is, is falling down towards the southeast from overhead. Um, and Orion is visible, the wonderful constellation of Orion, which we'll see much better in the winter. And Gemini and the Milky Way flows downwards between them and past uh, the bright star Sirius. Uh, there are no bright planets visible in the sky at this time, because by that time in the morning before dawn, both Jupiter and Saturn have already set in the west southwest but what you can see besides the milky way is a glow uh, in the uh, east and northeast and this is the zodiacal light this is the best time of year for spotting the zodiacal light in the morning sky um, it's uh, the false dawn caused by uh, particles uh, in orbit around the sun scattering the sunlight and uh, it, it's visible as a cone of light stretching up from where the sun will eventually rise now back to the Summer Triangle, let's join the dots again. That's the Summer Triangle. Uh, the Milky Way flows through the Summer Triangle and quite close to the star uh, Deneb, uh, the brightest star in, 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 in Cygnus. And it, it also has this dark rift along the plane of the Milky Way caused by the same reason we see it, dark rift in dark uh, bands in, in the uh, Andromeda galaxy. This is a gas and dust in the plane of our disc-shaped galaxy. This, uh, this dark band is called uh, the, the Great Rift. If I plot on this diagram uh, Stellarium's artwork for the constellations, you can see Cygnus the Swan flying downwards uh, with its tail at Deneb and its head at this star, which is its beak at this star, which is um, Albario. Here's the Lyra or Lyre uh, with Vega, and down here is uh, Altair in Aquila, the Eagle. And, more or less set entirely inside the Summer Triangle, there are two smaller constellations, Volpecula the Fox, uh, not terribly noticeable, uh, but Sagitta the Arrow is, is a bit more arrow-shaped, and that's also there. Alongside the Summer Triangle, the nice, nice shape of Delphinus the Dolphin, and further over here to the east is Pegasus the Flying Horse. Uh, some malfunction means he's flying upside down, his head's down here, and uh, alongside him is Aquilius the Foal, or the a uh, young the baby horse, um, uh, Pegasus and, and Aquilius. Last time I spoke two months ago in, in July, beginning of July, I concentrated on, on this region over here, Hercules and, and Lyra, 
and I mentioned the double double Epsilon Lyra, not far from Vega, and M57, the Ring Nebula, uh, in the southern part of the uh, constellation of Lyra. Uh, what I want to do now is pick out some other objects uh, closer to the Summer Triangle, starting with Albario, uh, the beak of Cygnus, uh, a double star. Uh, it's also Beta Cygni. Beta is normally the, the designation given to the brightest, second brightest rather, star in a constellation, Alpha being the first. But Beta, you would expect it to be the second brightest star in the constellation. In fact, it's fainter than Deneb, obviously, which is Alpha. It's also fainter than these three stars uh, in the cross of, of Cygnus, uh, in the wings of Cygnus. It's the fifth, uh, Albario is the fifth brightest star in Cygnus. And the two stars that make it up, if you look at uh, the uh, photograph of it by Mark Phillips, the two stars that make it up are 35 arc seconds apart and two magnitudes different in brightness, but there's still some controversy as to whether uh, this is an optical double star, in other words, the stars are physically connected or not. Uh, the brightest star, by some measurements, is about 434 light years from us, and the fainter one, the fainter one of the two stars, may be around 30 light years closer to us, and if that's the case, then they're not uh, physically connected. There are some clues in the way they're moving uh, against the background stars that they may not actually be uh, physically gravitationally bound together. Not far away from Malbario is perhaps the most attractive object inside the Summer Triangle. This is M27. And one way to find it is to uh, form a sort of box with uh, the wings of Cygnus and Albario like this. And this corner marks the position of, of Messier 27. Um, it's a planetary nebula. It means it's not a planet, but it's, it's called a planetary nebula because early astronomers uh, thought, planetary, uh, thought they looked a bit like faint planets. Uh, this is a photograph taken by Hugh again of, uh, of M27. And Pat, uh, divine uh, got a deeper uh, exposure of the same object, but makes it look rather different. It's around magnitude 7.6 and it's eight arc minutes across. I've always found it quite easy to spot uh, through binoculars on a dark night. It's around 1,200 light years from us. And uh, the emission from this gas uh, is, uh, the gas is energized by ultraviolet radiation from the central star from which the material was being lit up was ejected uh, sometime between perhaps 10,000 and 15,000 uh, years ago. Now let's look at this region uh, around Sagitta, the arrow. This is it in close up, and that's the, where M27 is located. There's a further Messier object uh, nearby, four degrees south of M27. It's called M71. It's not a planetary nebula. In fact, it's a, it's a globular cluster, but a fairly loose and a fairly small globular cluster. It's about nine or 10 billion years old, and it lies 13,000 light years from us. It's one of the smallest globulars we know of, and, and Sagitta itself is the third smallest constellation in the sky. Uh, it's visible in binoculars, magnitude seven or eight just about, but it's not very impressive. More memorable group is over here. Uh, sorry, that's an image by Hugh of uh, this uh, cluster, which is also called the angelfish or the arrowhead uh, cluster. Uh, another object of interest is, is over here uh, to the west of M71, to the west of, 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 uh, of Sagitta. And this is the coat hanger, uh, so called, because it looks like an upside down coat hanger in the sky. It's also called Broche's Cluster or Colander 399. In fact, it's not a cluster at all. All the stars there are lie at different distances, just a random alignment of stars that happen to form a pleasing cotanger. And it's quite an obvious thing to look for in any image that records the, uh, uh, the summer triangle. It's about a third of the way uh, in line between Altair and Vega, very easy to spot. There's a further object here, and that's NGC 68, often known as NGC 6820. You can see it labeled on this Stellarium plot or uh, meant, uh, plotted as a, as a pinkish mass there. Um, and that's uh, an image by Pat Divine of, of this uh, area. Uh, 
It's labeled as NGC 6820, NGC 6823, and Sharpless 86. But most people call this region NGC 6820. This image, by the way, was taken again last Friday night by Pat. Uh, so we were quite busy that night and with some very successful astro images. In fact, the overall nebula, this glowing mass of emission, is called Sharpless 86. Uh, and uh, although it's often called NGC 6820, its true name is Sharpless 86, and it lies around 6,000 light years away. And as so many of these objects are, they're emission nebula, the glow from the UV excitation of, of gases. In fact, NGC 6820 is there, and it's just there. It's this tiny blot, uh, which is uh, a reflection nebula, uh, uh, alongside the, the glowing emission nebula. That's, that's a true NGC 6820. And where's NGC 6823? Well, it's the name given to this star cluster in the middle. And this is quite young, about 2 million years old, about 50 light years across, and it's dishing out with its hot uh, blue stars, lots of UV, and that's causing the, the gas to fluoresce. Um, the Pleiades, by comparison, are about 8 light years across, so smaller and older. Uh, about 100 million years old in the case of the Pleiades. And they're relatively, uh, uh, relatively nearer at 444 light years compared with the 6,000 light years away for the star cluster here, for this star cluster. One other object I want to pick out here is, uh, to, uh, is M15 in, actually lies in Pegasus near the nose of Pegasus uh, and to the uh, east of the nice pattern of Delphinus. It's M15, which is another uh, globular cluster, much more impressive than M71. Um, this is an image by, by Mark Phillips. It lies uh, in about 33,600 light years away, and uh, it's around 12 and a half billion years old. And while M71 um, was very loosely packed. This is one of the densest uh, star clusters we know of. I think that's enough for me for this month. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Alan. Thank Alan for that. Comprehensive as always. Thank you. Sharing. Right. Yeah. Um, well, that's about it for tonight. So, um, just as a reminder, this is what's coming up can you see that yep yep um keep an eye on our website and facebook page and so on but um hopefully we'll see you again thank you don for tonight's talk that was really excellent and um hope we'll see you at the, the next meeting thank you everyone good night <laughs>